Okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, I think one thing you could do if you wanted to, um, Angie was saying, I think on the top right, there's a view thing and you can go to speaker view if you just want to see me on the screen. But if you want to see everybody else, you can leave it at gallery view. Um, so thank you very much for signing in. I, I love these lunch and learns because I learn a lot from them myself. I, I log into them as often as I can. And just to introduce them really, uh, this is a series and all of the upcoming and past events I'm reading on my screen here, they're all on the republicofwork.com site. And there'll be a recording of this talk available for the next four weeks. And, and you will be sending out an email probably tomorrow, a feedback email. And on that email, I'll include my LinkedIn and I'll also include some references to some of the things that I talk about, like some studies that were done and things like that. So you don't need to scribble down the names of books or anything. If I happen to mention them, I'll, I'll include them in the email. Um, and also when you're replying to the feedback mail, if you, you know, feel free to put in suggestions as to how the whole Lunch and Learn series can be improved. So did I get that all right, Angie? Okay, so my name is Tom Connolly. I've been around a long time. I'm, I am from Galway originally. And in 1981, I moved from Galway to Cork because I got a job in Apple. And my mother was very proud of me at the time getting a job in Apple. And it was at a time when the whole PC revolution was just really starting and most of us didn't even know what it was. So I, I spent 20 years in Apple and it went there's a great saying in a movie, uh, The Bucket List, Morgan Freeman is talking about how quickly time passes. He says it's, it's like smoke through a keyhole. And that's how fast the time my first 20 years working went in Apple. And what I did in Apple was um, mainly project management of new products. And really my job in Apple was to go to California, get to know the design teams, get the confidence of the design teams that we in Cork could understand and build their products, come back, go out to the sales and marketing guys around Europe, tell them about the products, get their feedback, bring that feedback back to the design teams. And when the product was designed, set up the factory in Cork to build them and ship them all over Europe in 29 languages. And it was as much an ambassadorial role as it was any other sort of a role. And very early on in my career, I had to learn how do you manage when you're the, the company that's your boss lives in California and there, there's an eight hour time difference. So I had to learn very quickly, kind of the hard way, how to manage time. And I spent 20 years in Apple and at the end of 20 years, I kind of burned out really. Um, it was very intense and I did a lot of things, including there's a lovely word called restructuring, which means um, you take an organization in a company and you, you re-engineer it so that some people lose their jobs and other people get different jobs. Some people get hired, some people get fired. And I did that the last five years I was there and I had to let go a lot of my friends, a lot of people that I had grown up with really in Apple uh, for the good of the business. And, and that's a tough thing to do. And when I was finished all that, I was kind of thinking, you know, I've, I've had enough of this. I've had enough of big company work. So I left Apple. My boss very kindly gave me a package which allowed me the cushion, I suppose, to set up my own business. And since then, I've really, the best way I can describe myself is kind of a freelance project manager. And I project manage anything that moves, really. Um, I love projects where people don't really know what the next step is. Uh, I'm very bad at projects that are easy to understand and very easy to do and that a lot of people can do. If, if you give me something that should be easy and there's a great process around it, I'll actually disimprove it because I get bored. But if you give me something that I don't know how to do, I'll stay awake all night until I figure out how to do it. And that's kind of what I've done. So I've done a lot of different projects uh, going from biomedical industry to, I think the funniest one I ever did was I helped a guy set up a snail farm up in Carlow. Um, I did a business plan with them and helped them set up the whole snail farm to try and sell snails bread in Ireland to Europe when the summer was too hot in Europe for, for snails to, 
to exist properly. So mad stuff. And in all of that, uh, the thing I had to learn most about was how do I manage my own time? And I started off years ago thinking I don't have enough time. Um, I haven't enough time to do stuff. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. And really, it got me to thinking about, well, hang on a second. Time, time, the nature of time. Time is actually the most predictable thing we have. You always know that if you wait for one minute, one minute will have passed. There are very few other things that are as predictable as time. And we all have enough time. The problem that we have, and I include myself in this sometimes because I'm not perfect at managing my time yet. Uh, the problem we all have is we give it away too easily. And time is different. I do a lot of workshops and in the old days, over a year ago, I used to do a lot of workshops in Dublin. And I would, the end of the workshop is a time management module. And I would start off the workshop, I would borrow five euro from somebody. I'd say, can you lend me five euro? And, you know, if you go to a workshop or a one day course or a two day course, it's like you're back in school, right? You do whatever the instructor tells you to do, at least in the first hour until you know how much you can get away with. So somebody always, you know, digs in their pocket or their purse and, and gives me a fiver. And all I do with that fiver is I take it, say thank you, and I put it in my pocket. And I don't mention it for two days. And I can see the person from time to time sort of looking at me nervously, wondering, are they ever going to get their five euro back? Or, you know, have they just been had? And they always know, they always know deep down, they know that they can get that five euro back. They know they will. However, if you give five minutes to somebody, that is five minutes of your life that you will never, ever get back. And that's the difference with time. So do not give your time away. There's a man called Vitaly Gollum. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He is a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. And I've seen him speak a few times. One of them was in Parque Cueve. I think it was an IT at Cork annual event. And he had a great expression about time. He said, time is a non-refundable limited resource. Non-refundable limited resource. So don't give away your time. Uh, you won't get your time back. You're not able to get your time back. And how much time should you keep to yourself and how much time should you give to other people? Well, the time that you have is a total function of what you're doing with it. So what I mean by that is if you're waiting for a lift, if you're waiting for an elevator at the bottom of a 50 story building, and if you're waiting for two and a half minutes for that elevator, it's like an eternity. If you have two and a half minutes left in order to get to the airplane that's leaving in two and a half minutes time, and you're the other side of the airport, that is not an eternity. That's hardly any time. If you give 10 minutes to somebody where uh, you're giving them an opinion, that's kind of possible. But it's almost impossible not to give away an hour if you give away a minute. Uh, there's a research program that was carried out in, I think it was a university in California. Like I said, I will, I will dig up the research link and, and I'll send it on. But they researched if you're engaged in a cerebral activity, and by that I mean one that requires you to think, um, you know, a knowledge kind of a thing. And most of our jobs these days require us to think. Even manual jobs, we always have to use some kind of a tool or some kind of a device. So we're always thinking. If you're interrupted when you're in the middle of an activity that requires you to use your brain, and even if that interruption is only for five minutes, it takes you something like 27 minutes to get yourself back into the place that you were, to get back in your stride, to get back into that task at the same speed. So if somebody interrupts you for five minutes, you actually lose a half an hour. You lose about a half an hour. And how many hours in a day do we work? How many hours a day do we have? If that's the total amount of time in a day, how much time is that? Do you, want to, do you want to pop in the answer to chat there, anybody? My chat screen is over here. How many hours in a week? 
So we do eight hours of work, somebody says. How many hours do we have in one week? Hundred and sixty eight. So your work is something that's with you more time than you're actually spending working. It's in your head. You're thinking about it. So to manage your time, and this is what I found, the best thing to do is stand back and say, what am I doing with my time? So you, 168 hours. There's four things that you need to divide that time into. The first thing, the first thing is sleep. You have to sleep. If you don't sleep properly in a week, you're actually no good for anything else. So make sure when you're managing your time that you have enough time to sleep. The other thing to make sure of is that you make time for family and for friends. And it won't happen automatically. You have to say to yourself, I am going to make time to spend with my family and friends. Because guess what? That is what life is about. Life is not about work. Life is about your family and friends. When we die, very few people are going to say, he worked 3,243 hours. He worked in these companies. They're all going to say, he was a nice guy. I won't speak ill of the dead, but we never got on. They'll talk about you. They'll talk about how you are, how you were, and how you will be. That's what life is. If you don't make sure that you sleep, and if you don't make sure that you have a circle of family and friends, and it doesn't matter how big the circle is, could be two, could be 22, um, then you're not in a place where you can properly manage your, your, your time for work. So then you obviously have time for work. And most of us, do not have a choice. Most of us have no choice on the amount of time we have to spend at work. Um, I made a choice a few years ago, maybe three years ago, and the choice I made was I am only going to work on average three days a week. And I was in a position to make that choice because I've had a life, I've had a career, my kids are all grown up, my mortgage is paid. I think I have enough money to live for the rest of my life. I think. I'm not sure. I don't know. My wife is the same. And I said, why would I spend five or six or seven days a week working when I really need to be living? Because I'm at the latter end of my life, not the, not the, the start of my life. So I made a decision, I'm only going to work three days a week. What does that look like? What it looks like for me is there are months in the year where I have no work. There's months in the year where I do no work. That is paid work, paid consultancy, paid workshops. There are months in the year, like this month, where I get up at six in the morning and I go to bed at one in the morning. But if you average it all out over the year, it's about three days a week. Um, and I think for all of us, depending on where we are in our career, have we got kids? Because kids take your time. You don't have a choice. You have to give it to them. Um, where are you in your career? If you want to build your career, you have to spend more time working. But it's always worth standing back and saying, what will I decide? You know, will I decide that I'm going to stop my career here so that I can bring my life? And finally, the thing that what I, I find, and I was certainly guilty of it for many years, what most of us forget. Yourself. You have to spend time for yourself. What that means is, I'm sorry, dear wife, I'm going for a cycle and I'll be gone for two hours. And she says, more like three. And I say, probably. And I don't feel a bit guilty about it. Cycling is one of my things. Whatever your thing is, carve some time in the day for yourself doing activities, activities that you love, activities that you want to do. And if you do not do that, if you just work and raise your family and don't spend any time for yourself, when you get to a stage in your life, where you can retire or take it easy. There was a survey done again in California 
on CEOs who lived and breathed their lives for their company and they retired because they had to retire at 65 years of age and within two years over 60 percent of those people had passed on they had died and the reason was they literally gave their lives to their work if you retire and you do something like take up golf the day you retire and then you never played golf before and you take up golf the day you retire that is bad for you golf is an incredibly difficult lifetime learning thing what you need to do and a professor in a course i did over in INSEAD years ago said this very clearly you need to develop hobbies for yourself and to develop a hobby to the level where you can get enough satisfaction from it takes 10 years. So if you're 50 now and you think you'll retire at 60, take up a hobby because it'll take you 10 years to learn that hobby well enough and get involved well enough in it to get the fulfillment back from the hobby. Because you'll start off with unconscious incompetence. You won't know that you can't do it. You'll think you're great. And then you'll start meeting other people who are doing the same hobby, whether it's playing music or whatever it is. And you'll realize that you actually don't know what you're doing. And that's the kind of conscious incompetence stage. So you start off unconsciously incompetent. You move with practice to consciously incompetent. And you practice, practice, practice. There are the three secrets to learn anything. You practice, practice, practice. It's the three secrets of learning to manage your time, by the way. If you agree with what I'm saying here, practice those techniques. So when you practice, 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 you get to a point where you're consciously competent. I can go out now to the other room. I can take up my mandolin. I can play a tune that I know that I've practiced for years. I'm consciously competent, but I'm very aware of which note is coming next. If I keep practicing and I don't practice enough, I will eventually get to the stage that's called unconsciously competent. And that's heaven. That's where you want to be, where you can pick up your mandolin or your knife if you're doing carving or whatever it is. And unconsciously, you're already performing it at a high level. And that gives you, as a human being, huge satisfaction. And it lengthens your lifetime. And it makes you have a happier lifetime. And it allows you to say, I'm glad I put that time into myself and myself only. And not, not do the guilty thing of not putting time into yourself. I think in Ireland, I've noticed of all the nationalities I've ever talked to, we in Ireland are the most guilty at spending our time on ourselves alone. We kind of want to give our time to everybody else. So that's the nature of time. So how do you manage all this time? Years ago, um, when things were genteel, um, if you went to a dance and you were a man, you would go to the dance and all the ladies would be standing on one side of the room. And they'd have little cards in their hands, a dance card. And on that card would be written the name of each dance. And you would go over to a lady that you fancied and you would say, could I have dance number three with you, please? And if she looked at you and fancied you too, she'd say, okay, I'll put your name down for dance number three. And there might be 12 dances in the night. Now, when that lady's dance card is full, the lady cannot dance anymore. Look at your time like that. Do a dance card for your time. Put down, on a flip chart is how I do it every month, put down what are the key things you want to accomplish in this month? What are the key things you have to do? You have to do this day's training. That's one day of the month gone. You have to do your vet returns on Tuesday morning. That's a half a morning gone on Tuesday morning. You have to go to these three Zoom calls. You have to go to these five Teams calls. You have to go to these 365 Google Meets meetings. That's 90% of your month gone. You're going to get interrupted. Put in a number for that. Now you can start thinking about what I want to do in the month in terms of projects, in terms of tasks, and you put them down. You do a dance card for the next six weeks. You have the list of all the things that you have to do and that you want to do and put for the next six weeks, how many hours will I spend on each of those things? 
And if you do that at the start of this week, this day next week, review it, look at the actual. I thought I'd be six hours in meetings, turns out I was 18. I thought I'd do the VAT returns in four hours. It took me all day because I lost some of my receipts, that sort of thing. Do the actual and keep that dance card rolling. You can't dance anymore when it's full. You have to guess how much time you're going to spend at each thing. Your guess is no good unless it's based in fact. Do it every week for four, five, six weeks and you'll get into it. A technique I do, one of my uh, kind of mentors, partners, one of the guys that I do a lot of work with and for, Fergus O'Connell, he's into extreme time management. Uh, what he does, he does his list for the month and he takes half of it and he just crosses it off. And, and I say, well, you can't do that, Fergus. He said, I know that I can't do enough. I, I haven't enough time to do all these. He just crosses it off and he disappoints people that might want him to do things. Now, he can do that. I can't do that. What I do, my version of extreme time management, I usually have this flip chart in the corner of my office and I do what I just said. I write up my schedule for the month and what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it and how many hours I'll spend. And then I say to breed my wife, would you like a cup of coffee? And I put on the coffee up here and she comes up for a cup of coffee. And she'll look at the flip chart and she'll say one of two things. She'll either say, do you really think you're going to do all of that this month? And I will know by the way she says it that I won't. So I'll cross out some things. Or she looks at it and says, yeah, that's reasonable. And I'll know that I should be able to achieve everything on that flip chart. So I kind of use Breed's reaction as a gauge. And do that yourself. If you have friends that you know, that you know well, that you work with, and you talk to them about your plan for the month, ask them, what do they think? Do they think you'll be able to get through it? And guess what? You learn about yourself that way. And the kind of final thing then that I want to say about, you know, how do you control your time and manage your time is learn how to say no. It's probably the most important thing that we can learn in the workplace, maybe in other places, certainly in the workplace, how do you say no when your boss says do it or else? When your boss says the company is depending on you? When your boss says, I know I shouldn't ask you to do this and I know that you're overworked when you please. So your bosses have ways of cajoling, persuading, threatening, asking you to do things. And what you must develop is a kind of a hard shell that says, how is my dance card looking? Have I really any time? And you have to think about it as, this is what I find the best way, you think about it as if somebody is trying to give you a task, they're trying to get you to do something, visualize that task, that's a monkey on their back. And what they're trying to do is sidle up to you and take that monkey and put it on your back and run away because now the monkey is yours. So you have to be careful how people ask you. Somebody is likely to say to you, Tom, would you have a look at this because I'll be handing over this project to you. And if you can have a look at it now, you know, you can have some input and feedback as to how long it will take. If you say okay to that, what you're saying okay to is you're saying, okay, I recognize that this project is now my project. I, I and therefore I have accepted that monkey and I put it up on my own back and now I have the monkey. And I can look at that project and look through it and I can realize, oh, geez, there isn't enough time to do this. I did this with a client last night, by the way. Um, and then I go back and say, I've just realized there isn't enough time to do this. And the client said to me, Tom, you've already committed, haven't you? You're a problem. So try and make it not your problem. Try and say no and think about it in the, in the monkey example. Say something like, I would love to be able to help you with your problem. I'd love to be able to help you with your task. I'd love to be able to help you out and get you out of this pickle that you're in, but I don't have time. If you start off saying I don't have time, they can query that. They can say, but I saw you in the canteen yesterday for two hours. It looks like to me like you have a lot of time. So steer the conversation to where you want it. It's their problem. If I'm talking to you, it's your problem. And it doesn't become my problem 
until I understand a hell of a lot more, number one, about what the problem is, and number two, about my own time and whether I really have enough time or not. And why I say at the start of this call, I think it's, um, I don't know if I said it, but it was certainly on the material used to advertise it. I say, give yourself the gift of time. Think about Christmas, it, you know, give yourself Christmas. What Chris, what's Christmas about? Making a list, you make a list, check it twice. I have seen more theories about list making than I have met people. Everybody has a theory about making a list. I don't know any other way to figure out how you know, what you're going to, what you're going to do, how do you know what's ahead of you if you don't make a list. There are some people who can keep a list in their heads, but they're, they're the vast minority of us. Make a list, write it down, write down a list. I don't care whether it's on a flip chart, whether it's on your phone, whether it's on your laptop, whether it's on a board on your wall, whether Ronan writes it on his blackboard, doesn't matter. Write down on a list, make the list. Check it twice. When Fergus O'Connell is checking his list, he cuts off half it. And he has the battle early in the month with people who want him to do stuff that month. Very first day of the month, that's when he disappoints them. They get over it. Sometimes he loses the battle, sometimes he has to take some stuff. But in general, he makes his list, he cuts it in half. I make my list, I check it twice. Then we get to the naughty and nice bits. Don't let naughty people take your time. You've made a list, you do your dance card, you've identified your time, you've made sure you have enough time for yourself, you've made sure you have enough time for sleep, you've made sure you have enough time for your hobbies. Don't let naughty people come along and say, Tom, will you just add another bit to that? Tom, will you spend another day on that? Don't let them. It's your time. It's not their time. And don't be too nice. You have to think of yourself first. If you think that people will like you more because you're nice to them in the work environment, it's not true. And I don't mean don't be polite. By all means, be polite always. But if, if you think you'll be popular by doing whatever people ask you to do, that, that will not work because what will happen is you'll be too nice, you'll take on too much. You take on a lot of things, you'll find yourself going back to people saying, I'm so sorry, when I, when I took that task, when I took that project, when I promised you that, I didn't realize how much I'd done, I didn't realize how much, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to delay my deliverable back to you. And you know, in most societies in the world these days, you know, we, we, we talk to everybody in the world now through these screens. And when you're talking to people from different cultures and different societies, you, you're on your best behavior, right? Because there aren't as many shared norms as there would be if you were down in the pub after work with a few of your friends. So we're all quite polite to each other these days. Um, and if somebody doesn't like what they're hearing, they can always turn off their computer and say, oh, my internet is bad today. You know, people have a way of getting away from you. So we're all kind of polite. But if people politely say to you, that's okay, I understand, try and do better the next time. Don't be fooled into thinking that they're happy. They're not happy. None of us likes when somebody comes back and says, I failed in what I promised you I would do. We also don't like when we're trying to get somebody to do something and they won't do it. You know, Tom Connolly told me to say no. Tom Connolly told me not to take the monkey off your back. They won't like that. But you're in a place where you can discuss that. You can negotiate that. You can argue about that. And you can say, well, OK, maybe I could do this task for you, but I'll have to not do these other tasks. So you can negotiate that up front. Um, if you've planned, as, as happened to me, I have a client that I just took on two days ago. Their business is in an emergency. That's why they've hired me just too late. But anyway, um, I never get hired early enough. I have an ongoing client that I owed some report to yesterday. And I rang him up yesterday morning. And I said, Rory, I'm sorry. I don't think I'm going to have that report for you today because I, I got a new client. Tell the truth. I got a new client last night and he's in trouble. And my question to Rory, my existing client, was, is it a problem to you if I delay this? 
or do I need to work late tonight to do it? So I give him a choice. If it was a problem for him, I would have been working late last night on it. It turned out it wasn't. He's happy enough to have it Wednesday. Initially, I was going to ask him, would it be okay to deliver today? But I said to myself, wait a minute. I actually know Rory very well. So I know Wednesday will be plenty of time. So why not give myself that time? So now I have all day tomorrow to do that report because today I'll get all the busy stuff out of the way. And that is pretty much my uh, stream of consciousness on time and how to manage it. And I hope that it gives some of you some ideas and will help in some way. And I'd be delighted then if there's any questions around you, if there's anything that's in the chat that people want to talk about. It's 25 to two, I think we have another 20 minutes or so. Yeah, so we have some bits in the chat there. So, um, let's see. yeah, so Adrian said, saying no to one thing that maybe you don't really want to do, even if you have time to fit in, is potentially saying yes to something better. And then Alex asked, if you schedule out six weeks, then take account of how you actually spent your time versus your schedule every week. How often do you adjust that six week schedule and what is a fair amount of time tracking each day slash week? Okay, that's a great question. I think um, you're looking at it every week. Like what I advise people to do, and I hate myself every Friday for this, <laughs> is when it's Friday, and you finish sort of mid-afternoon, which a lot of us do really, you know, we kind of really are finishing. Look back over the week, take half an hour, look back over the week and, and, and say, is my six week plan still looking okay? And if it's not, adjust it. And you'll be delighted on Monday morning that you did that on Friday. You won't be delighted doing it on Friday. And do it every week and you get better at it. If you're doing that as a pattern, you get better at it. So the first few weeks, you could find yourself Friday scratching your head for an hour and a half, like I did at the start of the pandemic. How the hell am I going to move all my stuff online? What does that look like? Now it takes me 10 minutes every Friday to do my online planning for the next six weeks. Back then it took me an hour and a half. I think I, did I answer that okay? Yeah, thank you. Um... So Philippa also has another question. It just says, what are your thoughts on interruptions and deep work time? Interruptions and? Deep work time. Deep work time. Yeah. Um, there is a time management technique called Pomodoro technique. Does anybody ever hear of the Pomodoro technique? Um, Pomodoro is the Italian for tomato. And the Pomodoro technique is basically based on the fact that if you want to get something done really well and you want to concentrate on it, spend 25 minutes on it. Take a break at the end of the 25 minutes, but have no other interruptions in that 25 minutes. And you'll probably get more done in that 25 minutes than a full day. And I'll come back to a full day in a few minutes time. So I have a task to do. I divide my day into 25 minute intervals I spend 25 minutes just on that task. I turn off my phone. I turn off all notifications on my laptops. I go into a room that nobody else can go into. And I just do that. I love that. If you can get time like that, do that. The reason it's called the Pomodoro Technique, I'll, I'll send the link in my, in my email, but you can also Google it, is the guy who came up with this, who realized and developed the fact that 25 minutes is a great time, but then take five minutes break. Um, used a kitchen timer in the shape of a tomato. And I just happened to have one here, which can you believe that? Um, now I bought this, I don't know if you know a site called wish.com where you can buy you know, lots of things for a, a euro, but it might be a year before you get them. And I said, wouldn't that be a great prop to have for my talk for the Republic of Work? I actually forgot about it until you asked that question. And it, it's kind of counterproductive because it doesn't work. I, I moved it to 25 minutes once, it rang once, and it never worked since, but it, I can still show it, look, that's it. And the reason for the using a timer, not your phone, is if you're using your phone, I don't know about you, but I can't turn off all the notifications. I always leave one or two on, just in case I miss something really important. So if I'm using my phone as a timer, 
And I see out of the corner of my eye that Rory wants to report earlier than he thought. I'm now distracted. It's been a waste of time trying to do this Pomodoro technique. So deep time, not interruptions. You have a right not to be interrupted if you have a task to do that takes all of your focus. Um, find a timer that works. You can just use a clock. I think some places still have just have clocks. I just keep an eye on the time. And what I found myself is I've, I've found that I'm getting good at estimating 25 minute increments. You know, if I, if I say I'm going to spend about a half an hour on this, I actually do without having to time it. Again, it's back to the practice thing. And the, you know, there, there's different ways, but in, in one person who worked for me, she was a German lady. She worked for me years ago in Apple. And her job was, was a very focused job. She had, to, she had to modify the artwork on all the books, all the manuals and all the boxes for the, for the European market. And we were all always running around the place doing stuff. And Joanna had to actually get time to sit down and just work on the artwork. And she came up with a great technique one day that worked for her. She got a rope. Do you know if you're ever at a funeral or a wedding and there's a queue and they put these brass things and the red ropes, you know, along to kind of guide the queue. She got one of those red ropes and she put it across her cubicle with a big sign, do not disturb, and nobody disturbed her. I think you have to find your own way to put up your rope and your do not disturb, but it's really, really good for the quality of work if you can figure out how to do it. Okay. Any other? Um, so we have loads of thank yous in the chat and some people saying that they know the Pomodoro technique and they really like it as well. And if anyone else has any more questions that they'd like to pop in. Oh yeah, we have one here. So Alex says, the sections that you divided, that you've divided the day, are they equal or whatever works for you, your life? And where does, where does the facets of life cleaning to do lists fall into those categories? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. The, the way I do it on, on a different flip chart at the start of a month, I put down all the five days of the week. I don't work weekends. So I just put the five days of the week and I, I, I organize my workshops for Thursdays always. So Thursday I'll be working. And usually I try and work Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So I try and squeeze all my work stuff into Tuesday, Wednesday, and those bits of Thursdays where I'm not in workshops, leaving the rest of the week, Monday and Friday uh, and Saturday and Sunday free. Now, so that's about like, you know, three days out of seven, so three sevens, whatever percentage that is. Now my, my, my family life, I have lots of hobbies, Breed has lots of hobbies. We have a house we've been renovating since 2014. It's nearly finished. We have lots of garden projects. We have lots of things we have to do. I keep saying to Breed, we need to make a list. You know, I keep saying to people in workshops, you have to make a list. She won't make a list, <laughs> but she knows, she knows what she wants me to do every day that I'm not working. So what I have found is that those days that I will do what Breed wants me to do, I don't need a list because I have Breed and she'll tell me what she wants. And it's a, I found through experience, it's a lot better for me to wait for Breed to tell me what she wants than me to try and surprise her. Because I tried to surprise her earlier in our relationship saying, I'll do that now, I'll build that wall. And she'll say, I changed my mind about that wall, Tom. Why did you go and build it? So with, with the area of my life where I share with my wife, I let her be the king, be the boss, be the queen, and I just do what I'm told. My own life, I put aside four hours on a Sunday to go cycling. And if I don't go cycling, I do some other thing. And that's kind of about as much as I organize my, my private life. Very nice. Um, and then Ronan also asked, what do you think of the four hour work week? Four hour or the four day? Is it like four hours a day? Um, I'm presuming so. Uh, Ronan, can you? Oh, it's, sorry, I'll jump in there. Uh, thanks, Tom, for the, the talk. A lot to think of. The four hour work week was, yeah, uh, Philippa uh, wrote it. It was written by Tim Ferriss and his whole 
thing really was just like outsourcing as much as possible and um, only, ans I think it's only answering email for like 15 minutes a day and telling people this is when I'll reply. So just sort of putting the onus on the other person and one of his, no, I know this is more business owner than just working. But one of his other decisions was he told all his manufacturers and suppliers, if this, if the decision you need my help with costs less than a hundred dollars, just do it. So he does it just loads of, I suppose you call them loads of gatekeeping. So I'm just wondering yeah. if you have any thoughts on that. I, I mean, I, I love that. I, I love that, but it doesn't work for everybody. And if you're, if you're very senior in an organization, you can do things like that. If you're not senior in an organization, you, you have, you can't like Fergus O'Connell can cut off half his stuff because he runs the company. I can't cut off half my stuff because I'm a contractor to him and I have to, I have to balance a bit more, but I love the concept behind it. And all, what I love the most is being very clear with people from the start. I don't work Fridays. I've had that said to me an awful lot in the last few years. And unlike in the early part of my career, in the later part of my career, I've respected it. And there is a four day week movement that some of you may have heard about. And it turns out apparently a four day week is much more productive than a five day week. And this is the thing, I had a mental note to myself not to forget this. Somebody mentioned eight hours a day. How many hours a day do we actually work? How many hours? 2.5-ish, Alex says. Four, four is question mark from James. On average, on average, a good full day's work is between five and six hours. If you spend between five and six hours working, actually working now, that's pretty much a good full day's work. So if you have a task, say, in the project that has 13 hours of work associated with it, that task is going to spread into the third day. Because if you spend all day Monday, that'll be six hours. All day Tuesday, that'll be six hours. It'll spill into Wednesday. So the length of in project management, there's duration and there's, there's work. And the work is the number of hours of actual work. Duration is how long it'll take. If you have a six hour task and you're planning a project, add at least two days duration. Okay, I'll spend six hours, but I won't have it for you till Tuesday evening. And once you accept that and you believe it yourself, you can get other people to believe it. If you don't believe it yourself, if you kind of think, God, I'll be lucky to get away with it if I can get my boss to agree that really I'll only be working for six hours, then your boss will squeeze more stuff into your day and you'll run out of time. Thank okay. you. Um, we had a couple of questions about saying no as well. So Rima just said, What's the safest way to say no? And then on the back of that, James had a question that said, how do you negotiate the no when someone is unreasonable and demanding? So sometimes in life, and I've had at least three occasions, you have somebody who is so unreasonable that if you say no, you'll get fired. So that's the extreme. So I did it twice <laughs> out of the three. I didn't do it the third time because I was fed up getting fired. Um, so that's the extreme, and those extremes do happen, but they're not the norm. So normally people are reasonable. And I, what I find the best way to deal with a boss who's being unreasonable is to, is to put yourself into the boss's shoes. Most bosses are unreasonable because they themselves are being dealt with unreasonably. They're putting you under pressure because they're allowing themselves to be put under pressure. So if you put yourself in their shoes for just a minute, what I said to one guy last week, actually as late as last week, when he was trying to push me to do something, I said to him, you, you seem to be under a lot of pressure. Is somebody, is somebody giving you a lot of pressure? And he just opened up and he said, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, I think I can help you with that because I actually know that guy's brother. And we did. And you'd be amazed how often. So just kind of recognize the pain that your, your boss is in rather than get worried about what pain is going to give you. If that doesn't work, the best way to do, to do it is always have some equivalent of your dance card with you. 
whether it's, I always have this little notebook with me, um, of what you have on your plate at the moment. And when somebody is trying to give you something to do and you can see them coming and they're going to be hard to fend off, you say, well, hang on, no, I have a list of stuff here. I'll see if I can fit you in. And even the body language of that, they're already getting, they're already getting the message. It's not going to be easy for them to give this off to you. And, and if they say, yeah, I know you have a big list to do, but you say, okay, so I can fit you in. Okay, so I see you asked me to do these three things last week. So is it okay if I do this thing now, can I, can I put these things off until next week? That's how you negotiate. You are the only one who knows your own time. You have to prove to people that your time is full. This could be your phone. You know, a lot of people manage their lives with their phone. Now. That's fine. Show them your, your schedule on your phone. But I, I just think um, even in today's modern world, and I love technology, a notebook with a few things written on it that are the things that you have on your plate right now, it's a great tool. Because you, you, you remove the conversation from somebody saying, I have to get Tom to try and get to do, get him to do this to, oh gosh, I have to try and get a space in that agenda. You know, you kind of objectify it a little bit and you give yourself a break. Um, two other ways you could say no are, I'd love to help you with your problem, but I just don't have time. In other words, you don't, the first word out of your mouth is not negative. It's, I'd love to help you. But when they see you saying, I'd love to help you. They, they're getting a signal already. Oh, I'd love to help you. I would love to help, but I can't. You can also say to them something as simple as, I don't know how to tell you this. Like I was going into a meeting one time about five years ago with an investor and I didn't know how to tell him that he was actually after wasting a quarter of a million of his, of his fund. It wasn't my fault, thankfully. <laughs> I, was, I was just a messenger. Um, and I remember going into the room saying, geez, I don't know how to tell him this. What, what will I say? And I heard a voice in my head that somebody said to me one time to say, just say the first thing that comes into your head. So I went into the room and I went over to Jim and I said, Jim, I don't know how to tell you this. And he said, we've lost a quarter of a million, haven't we? And I said, yes. And what saying that to people, you give them a signal and you give them time to collect their own thoughts. This guy, Jim, was a control freak. So me telling him anything never worked. But what I did inadvertently was I gave him the opportunity to get back control because he was the one that verbalized, we've lost that, haven't we? And now he was back in control again. So get to know your boss as well as you can. Don't avoid your boss. If you get a new job, part of your job in a new job is spend some time with your boss to get to know them. If, if your boss doesn't come to seek you out and have a chat with you the first day you join, ring them up, Zoom them, Google Meets, Teams, say, I just like to have a chat and get to know you. That sort of stuff, in the, in, especially in today's world, helps you manage your time by knowing the person on the other side, know how to talk to them, know how much you can get away with, know what you can't get away with. I hope some of that helps. Thank you. And um, just going back to the pen and paper that you had, so David asked if there are any electronic tools that are best to achieve that level of time management. Um, I, I haven't found any, to be honest. Um, now, I could be guilty of being a dinosaur and loving my notebooks. Um, I like my my big problem with the electronic tools is there's so many of them. Like I have I have Outlook that I use all the time for my own stuff and the Outlook calendar. And then I have an iPhone. And to try and make sure that the iPhone calendar matches up with the outline Outlook calendar all the time, I end up inviting myself to meetings. <laughs> you know, so so if I'm inviting people through Outlook on the meeting, I'll copy my personal email on my on my iPhone. So when I click on that, the ICS will come up and I can have it on my personal calendar. I came across a thing the other day called Calendly, C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y. I'll, I'll send it in my email. It looks 
good. It looks very good. I actually signed up. There is a free version. I signed up to a version that it's $90 a year or something. $90 well spent. And what Calendly appears to be able to do, I've just started, so I don't know yet, but it appears to be able to integrate all your calendars. And what it appears to be able to do is, if you want a meeting with me, what I can do is send you a link. You click the link and you'll get a, an image of my calendar and you'll see where I'm free. And you put in your name there. Now, obviously, I will obviously have pre-populated my calendar. I can set, you know, the times that I want to be publicly available to people. That looks like a pretty good one so far. Up until now, I haven't found anything. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, bye.